Dear Father in heaven, thank you for our blessings. Thank you for your Sabbath day. Thank you for how you have cared for us and all that you have done for us. Thank you for your guiding in our past history. We know that you have been faithful to us. I pray, Lord, that we'll be faithful to you. May we see your past guiding and trust you now, trust you with our futures. I pray as we study these things, we're studying that past guiding and it is designed line upon line to explain and aid us as we live in this challenging time. I pray, Lord, that we will take hold of these lines, that we'll understand them as you intend us to, and that they will anchor us in this movement in your truth. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we have been going on quite some tangents over the last weeks. We've been intending to um, come around to, to a study of Millerite history, of our Alpha history, but we've been on a number of tangents. So I really want to I really want to get back on track. But we're going to begin with just looking at something that looks disconnected, but it will be connected. I want to come back to the end of ancient Israel. So, end of ancient Israel, when does that reform line begin? We'll mark it down the left side of the board. 4 BC, Brother Brendan, yes. What happens in 4 BC? End of ancient Israel, birth of Christ. So this is 4 BC. This is the first advent. This is the first advent. Why then, if we can answer in the chat, please. Why then? Why 4 BC? Birth of John the Baptist? Yes. Why 4 BC? Now there's a number of reasons, but there's one that I'm looking for. I'm not going to give you any other hints. Why, why does he choose that point in earth's history for his first advent? Someone says fourth generation. Someone says because of Rome. Why because of Rome? What was it about Rome? Rome united the known world. Political context. Because the Romans had control of the world. Because the Roman Empire is all connected. Yes. So the Roman Empire is all connected. How long does the Roman Empire extend for? 330. If we can please answer in the, in the chat because I can't mute, uh, continue to mute everyone or I'm probably going to be delayed. 330 AD, and it also begins well before then. So I'm looking for how, how long a time span. If we can please answer in the chat. 360 years. Some people say 360 years. Yes, and they're marking that particularly from, uh, th 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 that is quite a constricted period of time when it's, when it's ruling with, with, with that degree of dominion, you could extend it and see the Roman Empire as being much larger than that. Um, but I understand why you've said the 360, a time, as we're told in prophecy. So you could make that broader. You're extending it to, to that 360-year uh, time period. 
But even then, 4BC is quite specific. So I want to talk just briefly about the Pax Romana. The Pax Romana extended from about 27 BC to 180 AD. The Pax Romana, the Roman peace, was from 27 BC to about 180 AD. And within this about 200 year time period, you have 4 BC to 100 AD, and that is the reform line of the end of ancient Israel. So of the thousands of years that you have, Christ uses that time period for his first advent, that 104 year time period is neatly condensed within that 200 year Pax Romana. I'm just going to read a couple of quotes about it. The state of general peace which existed throughout the Roman Empire under the prosperous reign of Augustus Caesar was peculiarly fitted for the advent of the Prince of Peace. The Pax Romana, which is Latin for Roman peace, is a roughly 200 year long period in Roman history which is identified with increased and sustained inner hegemonial peace and stability though not without wars, expansion and revolts. It is traditionally dated as commencing from the accession of Caesar Augustus, founder of the Roman Principate in 27 BC and concluding in 180 AD with the death of Marcus Aurelius, the last of the good emperors, since it was inaugurated by Augustus with the end of the final war of the Roman Republic, it is sometimes called the Pax Augusta, Augustus peace. During this period of approximately two centuries, the Roman Empire achieved its greatest territorial The Roman Empire achieved its greatest territorial extent and its population reached a maximum of up to 70 million people. The Pax Romana is said to have been a miracle because prior to it there had never been peace for so many centuries in a given period of history. So you might have some peace, you might have a small period of peace, but you're not going to have just about two centuries of, of peace. And I have. When you're going to have 104 year reform line, when you're going to have that extent of, of time that's needed for the gospel to, to come, for Christ to have his first advent, to spread throughout uh, the, the known world, you need that type of time period of, of, of peace. Through the triumphs of Caesar, Augustus, Claudius and Marcus Aurelius, Rome became one of the largest empires that had ever existed, greater than that of Persia, Assyria and even challenging that of Alexander the Great. However, a territory that large caused many difficulties, many of them costly, riots, rebellions and insurrections. The solution to many of these problems came under the astute leadership of Emperor Augustus. It was called the Pax Romana or Roman Peace. He, he had gained political and military control and built an empire. Augustus secured the borders, stabilised the econ economy and brought a sense of peace. So you can see that what God is waiting for, for that first advent, is not only was there to be peace, but it was also to be a peace that spread throughout as large a territory as was then possible. So under Augustus, it reaches this large extent, a, a maximum of about 70 million people. And Augustus is able to bring peace to that 
large territory. It's almost as great as the empire of Alexander. Why couldn't Christ come in the time period of Alexander the Great? Because they're all fighting. That fighting never stopped. There wasn't peace. There needed to be this ceasing of war and rebellion, riots and insurrections. Under Augustus, they say even the seas were cleared of pirates, enabling the expansion of trade. New roads, over 50,000 miles of them, made communication easier. Rome was made great again. I don't know why they put that in there. But you have, you have peace, but not just peace on land, he's brought peace peace to the seas and he cleared the peace that the seas of pirates so there's peace on land there's peace on sea this empire extends to as large a territory as was then possible and then he also it, he's also known for the building that he did and what's one of these things being built the roads so we're going to go on to the roads as well because what were the roads all about? What did the roads make easier? This is all about communication. New roads, over 50,000 miles of them, made communication easier. The Roman people understood and valued the peace and security that Augustus' new order brought to the empire. To them he became a god and from this worship emerged the imperial cult. Henceforth an emperor would, with only a few exceptions, be deified after his death. So I wanted us to just have a very brief look at the Roman roads. In the itinerary of Antoninus, the description of the road system after the death of Julius Caesar and during the tenure of Augustus is as follows. With the exception of some outlying portions, such as Britain north of the wall, Dacia and certain provinces east of the Euphrates, the whole empire was penetrated by these itinera plural of Ita. There is hardly a district to which we might expect a Roman official to be sent on service either civil or military where we do not find roads. They reach the wall in Britain, run along the Rhine, the Danube and the Euphrates and cover, as with a network, the interior provinces of the empire. So I just want to share screen for a moment. This is the extent of Roman roads. This, uh, this photo, it's, uh, photo, th this um, description itself is, um, if we can please have people mute because I'm on share screen so I can't easily mute. This is, um, this is 170 AD, but much of this happened earlier. This is under, particularly as we heard described, under Augustus. So I couldn't find one that was going to give us that time period. This is 170, nearly to the end of Pax Romana. But this is what they already had put in place. And this is the network of Roman roads that extended through that Roman Empire. This was something that was quite new, especially to be done in this way to this extent. So I'm just I want us to see how they built these roads and I don't um, intend to spend 
long on this just to see how technical this was this wasn't just laying stones they actually had built up these extensive layers sometimes quite a few feet building up these layers um, this one shows a four layer system but these roads could extend three feet four feet into the ground depending on whether or not they were, they were built on solid land or more damp swamp like land so there's you can see how these these roads they still stand today how polished are those stones by the foot traffic these roads are so polished and you can see how years and years and years of those wagon tires have actually created these crevices in the roads and that was quite normal so when you think of how our roads break down today they didn't just lay stone slabs this was an extensive work that they did and honestly compared to how our roads stand up today this was quite an incredible feat some of them lasting thousands of years 2000 years by now um, and you can see the amount of traffic that these roads carried. So I'm just trying to get back to my screen. I, I don't know where that is. Okay, we're back. Thank you. Someone says they probably did not take as much weight as nowadays roads do. I think they took a lot of weight. When you have horses and carts and loaded carts, when you have the mark, march of infantry, I think they would have had quite a lot of wearing down. Uh, and probably a wearing down that was not as evenly placed. Those thin wagon wheels. Uh, how they would dry, drive into the, those cracks in the stones and dislodge. Um, I think it's quite incredible. So now that we've done our screen share, I'm just going to make someone else the host. Okay. So my mother is now the host. Okay. So I just wanted us to see the two things that made this that the right time for Christ to 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 come is is he had to wait for that time period. You couldn't come in the time of Assyria when they didn't have peace on land or sea, when they didn't have the roads to enable communication to travel. He has to wait till the, the reign of Augustus. That begins in 27 BC. 4 BC he comes and you have from 27 to 180 AD this time period that allowed for the growth and the spread of the gospel. I want to skip down now. We'll move past that. <laughs> to the Protestant Reformation. Now what had to happen? When does the Protestant Reformation take off? Someone give me a, a date, just a rough date. What year? Someone says 1517. Why 1517? Someone says 1529. I'm not saying there's one right answer, but if you can explain in a few words 
as you're able, why? Someone says, 1518, this is when Martin Luther nails his 95 theses onto the door of the Wittenberg Cathedral. 1518. Why 1518? Why can it happen now? Brother Bob and Sister Penny are going with the Diet of Spires. That's a clever answer because that's when it's called Protestant. 1518. So I'm going to read an article here. In the early 16th century, Martin Luther saw the advantages of making his vernacular treaties available cheaply to a growing body of avid lay followers. This is an article from, I believe this is at the Library of Arizona, uh, EDU. 15th century Europe, this is the 1400s, experienced a technological revolution in the invention of the printing press with movable type that bears comparison with that of computers today. So they're ignoring, this article is ignoring the fact that this technology first came up in the East. Um, this wasn't a Western invention. This happened in the East. Uh, it's one of the many, uh, many things that we see. Um, one of the many things we tend to attribute to the Western world that actually originally wasn't. But we'll go with this because they want to talk about uh, Gutenberg. Gutenberg lived from 1397 to 1468. The length of time that, that they go through, I, I won't read it all, but the, the obstacles that Gutenberg faced Finally, because of his debts, a banker confiscated his press. But Gutenberg before then managed to produce his famed 42-line Bible, dated approximately 1455. So they expect the Bible was completed in 1455. But then from 1455 to 1500, you had this kind of overlap where a few books were being printed. It wasn't then taking off, while at the same time there were many scribes as well. They say the second half of the 15th century was a time of overlapping technologies. Scribes continued tediously to copy texts by hand. Block books carved page by page from a panel of wood were stamped onto paper and a few books were printed on the newfangled machines. So all the way till 1500, you still have this overlap where the scribes are doing a large body of that work. Between 1517 and 1546, I think the correct year may be 1517, Luther's reforming career, Wittenberg Publishers turned out at least 2,721 works, an average of 91 works a year. This represents around 3 million individual copies and includes many of the milestone works of the era, not least multiple editions of Luther's German Bible. This vast blossoming, blossoming of what was essentially a new industry was entirely due to Martin Luther. The presses of other cities turned out thousands of Reformation and a few counter-Reformation books, pamphlets and broadsheets of their own. The success of Protestantism overall owed much to the printed propaganda. Catholic adversaries of the Reform movement never fully exploited the printing press for their own purposes. Luther's desire to expose the laity to his translation of the Bible and his message in other formats mo motivated his advocacy of universal childhood literacy, which he did, as you would expect, in a tract, which could be printed, which could be spread en masse. At least 11 editions of this tract appeared in 1524 alone. 
in more than seven cities around the Holy Roman Empire. As the novelty of the Reformation faded and religious nonconformity uh, became ubiquitous if persecuted, publishing houses began to focus on other interests, uh, fiction, uh, tracks of scientific uh, discoveries, thoughts, etc. So, printing press, around 1455, but then from all the way till 1500, you still have this overlap, but you need that printing press for what, what purpose? Thank you, Brother Esteban has, uh, Brother Emmanuel, they've shared that, um, what I'm reading from in the comment section. So this is the printing press. And this is all about communication. So even for the Protestant Reformation, what's it waiting for? Why isn't it coming 50 years earlier? If it came 50 years earlier, would it have been able to spread? No. When Martin Luther writes his 95 Thesis, he can then take it to a printing press have it printed en masse and spread through the Holy Roman Empire. You needed that advancement of communication technology to be able to have the message spread with power. Fifteenth, again the first sentence of that article, 15th century Europe experienced a technological revolution in the invention of the printing press with movable type that bears comparison with that of computers today. So that was how they had their technological revolution that particularly gave them the ability to communicate. So Paul was able to travel and communicate through ships on a sea cleared of pirates and roads laid by the Roman Empire. You come to the Protestant Reformation that was able to spread through this newfangled invention of the printing press. Coming to beginning of modern Israel. When does that start? So what are they going to need? What are they going to need to help them spread that message? At the very least, through the glorious land, through the United States. The first steam-powered passenger train began service on Christmas Day, 1830. December 25, 1830. Why is the first passenger train going to begin December 25, 1830? What happens a few months later in 1831? William Miller is months from beginning to spread his message. He's studying on his farm. He's studying in quiet from, 17, from 1816, really all the way to 1831. In fact, 1831, he begins to travel and teach. And only months earlier, December 25, 1830, passenger trains are introduced. The first steam-powered passenger service. Between 1830 and 1840, 2,800 miles of track were laid and opened to operation. So you have those 10 years, 1830 to 1840, 2,800 miles of track are laid and begin and are opened up to passenger trains. 
1840 to 1850, 9,000 miles of track are laid. And what happens in 1850 internally? 1850, they then have to take the, the message back to the world. They, they begin to, it's their Sunday law waymark. From 1850 to 1860, 30,000 miles of track, more than 30,000 miles of track are laid. It was between 1850 and 1860 that the railroads grew into a true network serving all of the states east of the Mississippi. Track mileage more than tripled. The US almost equaled the combined rest of the world in track mileage. So 30 to 40, right when Miller is needing to, to start teaching his message, you have the beginning, the introduction of passenger trains, 2,800 miles of track, 1840 to 1850, there's that first call, 9,000 miles of track, 1950, you have the second chart, that the 1850 chart printed, and they're to go to back to the world and you have a, a more than tripling over 30,000 miles of track laid connecting interconnecting the United States from pioneer writings this is um, James White I think actually I'm not sure about that one Um, I only want one sentence from it. It's talking about William Miller travelling in 1840, speaking about his lectures and his journeys. All that says is that by stage and railroad he reached his, low, his home in Lowhampton on Friday night following being absent from home nearly six months. So in that time period he's travelling by stage and railroad. 1852, there was a large um, camp, Millerite camp meeting, where William Miller spoke with Litch and Himes. The railroad and the steamboat brought 1,640 people from New York. 6,000 people attended, 1,640 people came from New York. They came by railroad and steamboat. Why could people gravitate en masse to these camp meetings. May 1842, a general conference was again convened in Boston. Camp meetings and conferences were being multiplied through the middle and northern states and Canada. And the flying angels or messengers of this judgment hour cry were seen moving with the speed of locomotives on railroads and in steamboats. So we haven't talked about the steamboat, but that was introduced at the same in the same history was also a technological part of that technological revolution. Not only on the campground, but from the highways, stages, steamboats and rail cars, the songs of Alleluia to the Lamb and shoutings to the Most High God resounded and filled the air as we passed along. How was it that the city authorities and the railroad directors at the Salem Depot allowed so many hundreds of these crazy fanatics to fill up their buildings and recommence their meeting in shouting and praising the Lord. So you have them gravitating to these camp meetings, but the ability that give, that what gives them the ability to do that is the, the, the technological revolution that gave the, the United States, the, 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 the train, the passenger train and the steamboat. It, it, many people argue that this technological revolution made more of a difference, made more of a change inside the United States than the American Revolution had itself. 1844, talking about Exeter as the people on foot, on trains, and in stages, wagons and buggies dispersed into the various states, a mighty cry went up throughout New England, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. So after 
the Exeter camp meeting, how did that message fly through the United States? It was in a large part due to what is known as the market revolution, which gave steamboats and passenger trains. The steamboat was introduced in, for, between 1807 and 1811, and by 1837 they had dug 3,000 miles of canals. So they dug these thousands of miles of canals so that they could connect different parts in the United States and run these steamboats. And that's how a people were also able to travel and spread the message. So trains and steamboats, and this is all for the communication of the message. Someone mentioned the telegraph. What year was the telegraph invented? 1844, and what were the two things that it, that it, its first message? What hath God wrought? And then what was it going to spread? Who won the 1844 election? You can't disconnect the external political processes of that history from the spread of the message. We have taken part in Miller's mistake when we ignore the external events. So, end of modern... Nineteen eighty nine. It is an evidence in and of itself that we are at the end of world's history, that God has a message that needs communicating. The evidence for that, one solid evidence for that, is our own technological revolution, the internet age, the information age, because this is all about communication. So you know that when we have such a, a, a revolution under the information age as the World Wide Web, that there's a message God is wanting to spread. First it began with the, rail, the, with the road networks under the Roman Empire. Then we gained the printing press. Then we gained the, the, the trains, steamboats, telegraph. Then we gained the internet, the World Wide Web. These are all the main steps in the advancements of communication and they all come at the right time period when God has a message that he wants to communicate. So prior to 1989, Adventism is neck deep in conspiracy theories. They have the great controversy. They have all of those things. The, the spread of the great controversy today, the spread of conspiracy theories today is not the message that God needs and wants to communicate of itself. The conspiracies certainly aren't and the great controversy needs explaining. He needs a movement. This was a movement, end of ancient Israel, three fractals, then, then their template line. This was a movement, this was a movement, this was a movement, four movements. So we have brothers and sisters today turning from this movement to learn from Adventist pastors, Protestant speakers. What are they doing? If you think an Adventist pastor is going to teach you righteousness by faith, put yourself back in one of those movements. If you're a Millerite and it's 1845 and you're going to go and sit at the feet of a Protestant pastor, What's the problem with that Protestant pastor? He rejected the 2300 days. He rejected the chart. And who is he praying to? Do you think he's going to explain anything about the character of God, the nature of the kingdom? If you're back in 32 AD, post the cross, you're a disciple, you're going to go and sit at the feet of a Pharisee. There is no salvation outside of that movement. If you're a disciple, can you go back and say, I'll take some of the parables, the part that I like, and I'm going to mix it with what my favourite 
Jewish Pharisee teachers mould the two and create my own truth. Is that safe? Protestant Reformation. You're going to take a little bit of that and a little bit of Catholicism. Is that safe? That's what they did. That's why they're not... They were not a... a they were not a success. This does not come under the same category as the beginning and end of ancient Israel and the beginning and end of modern Israel because even Martin Luther took a bit of that truth and then someone said, what about the Sabbath? And what did he say? I'm happy with Sunday. He kept his part of Catholicism and he tried to blend the two and the Protestant Reformation, as far as bringing about that, that a, a new church, was a failure. You come down to the beginning of modern Israel. Could the Millerites do that? Take part of Ellen White's message and then mix it with some Protestant pastor because the, they liked the way he spoke, because his conspiracy theories fitted their worldview. I want to be clear because that's occurring more and more through the movement in Australia, in Oceania who is particularly our audience today, if you're doing that, you're walking off the path and that's life and death. There is only salvation inside this movement. That sounds exclu like ex exclusivity. It always has been because the choice is always between life and death. So we have the information age, we have the World Wide Web, we are locked down under a pandemic and the message still can spread. I don't know how many current countries or continents we have represented today. I know Africa is, I know North America is, I suspect somewhere in South America, I, I know somewhere in South America, I see you there. We have multiple continents connected at one point in time. We should stop and think not only that that is so incredible, but why is that happening? Because as far as 6,000 years of Earth's history, we've only had that for a few decades, a couple of decades. And the reason that we've only had that for a couple of decades is because it came right on time, because now there is a movement that needs to go worldwide. So I wanted to lay that down before we, before we go into Millerite history because when we look at Millerite history, we need to see it in all its context. So I want to be clear that as I say certain things, um, as I make certain points, I'm not necessarily making application what I want people to have is a greater familiarity with the external events that happened in Millerite history. And the danger is, is that in mentioning an external event, people may think that I am making application. If I make application, I'll try and be um, explicit that that is what I'm doing. But there's a lot of this history that I, I would encourage us just to become familiar with. So we get a, a, some context. Someone asks, should we not hear Adventist pastors? That applies only for us or it applies to the Levites too. The Levites don't have much of a choice, although I think many are already coming in contact with the existence of this movement. We should not be going to Adventist pastors looking for light. They have none. If this is post cross, what happened to the veil in that temple? Is there any light left in that place? No. The Levites should be learning from the external events, I would suggest, more so than their pastors. The difficulty with looking to their pastors is even the ones on, on, that seem on the right side, it's usually a very... Um, it's usually such a mixture of truth and error. I think it's more dangerous than, than, than identifying correctly the external events. 
So I want to do, I, I, I want us to look at um, our alpha history. So up here I'll draw our Amiga, 1989, 9-11, Sunday Law, Close of Probation, Second Advent. I'm going to need a little more room this way. So we just want to do a short compare and contrast. And I really don't want to go over time today, so we're not going to do too much more. But I just want to make a suggestion, something for us to think about. This is the line, that this is the Omega. I've put it above our Alpha. 1798, there's going to be an increase of knowledge. 1989, there was an increase of knowledge. This was based on the unsealing of the Book of Daniel, unsealing on the Book of Daniel. We've already, when was this line first laid out? This one, with 1850. Don't have a great memory, but I think it was at the German International Camp Meeting. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Troy. Oh, back to front. Which was a year ago now. It's, all, it's exactly a year since that camp meeting. Thank you. So... We've already shown, in, been discussing in this movement for some time now, the importance of 1850 and how it lines up with the Sunday Law. And then identifying 1861 as the close of probation. eighteen sixty three is the second advent when that was meant to occur in this time of trouble that occurred under the American Civil War. So if we can do a, a short compare and contrast of these two histories Ellen White says in The Great Controversy, the 1260 days or years terminated in 1798. A quarter of a century earlier, persecution had almost wholly ceased. So 1798, you had 25 years earlier, takes you to 1773. 20 five years earlier and what happened here was the abolishment of the Jesuit order and this caused not a complete ceasing but a large ceasing of the persecution that had occurred during the 1260. Question. When we come to our line, what are we saying this Sunday law is about? 
Now that we're heading to the end of ancient Israel, what are we saying its theme is? So the persecution almost wholly ceased here, but what's going to happen, this is a line of failure, we can't forget, we need to make a contrast. It's an alpha history, therefore it is a contrast. It's a line of failure, therefore it's a contrast. So in this line of failure, If there's internal failure, what do you expect externally? Failure. So not only was, um, not only were the, were the Millerites, the Adventists, not only did they fail in their mission, but the external movement driving slavery in the United States, it also failed. This 1850 compromise was largely a failure when the northern states failed to enforce it. So we'll discuss that more. So we need to remember that this is failure. But persecution ceases here. But then what was to come in this time period? That persecution was going to rise up again. So persecution almost wholly ceases, not completely. Elder Paminda has discussed what happened in the French Revolution. That was also persecution in a, in a, from a different form. But then you know persecution is going to arise again. In our own history, what's 25 years before 1989? What's, what have we said this Sunday law issue is about? Going back to that German international camp meeting. What's the Sunday law issue about? We say Sunday law. Equality. So 25 years before, persecution almost wholly ceased, not entirely. It died down and it's coming back up. What happened 25 years before 1989? 1964. What happened in 1964? Civil Rights Movement? Civil Rights, Civil Rights Act. This is the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the prevalent Civil Rights Act. So 25 years, a quarter of a century, before 1989 and the increase of knowledge is a civil rights act which ended segregation in public places and banned employment discrimination on the basis of race, colour, religion, sex or national origin. It's considered one of the crowning legislative achievements of the civil rights movement. So 25 years before our time of the end persecution not entirely, but largely ceased under the Civil Rights Act. The argument since is just like the Constitution, just like the Declaration of Independence, who does it apply to? The Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, in their sometimes vague wor wording, should be used as intended for all. The Civil Rights Act should be... In read as intended for all and the debate happening now is about what who does it really apply to how far does it really extend so you have even just in the last months you have and this happened particularly under uh, the US Secretary, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo his commission on unalienable unalienable rights and what did his commission come to he believed there was original rights and then in, in the words of that commission it became a proliferation of rights suggesting that now there's too many now it's gone too far 
These rights were not meant to be extended to everyone with the type of um, completeness that, um, that we would argue they, they should be read as. So when you come back to the Civil Rights Act, it extended to women, it extended to people from different countries, it extended to immigrants, colour, black and white, of course, it's the civil rights movement, so that's the crowning context, religion, but also what was the debate last year, into this year. When it says discrimination on the basis of sex, what about those who identify as a different gender? What about those who are born attracted to someone of the same gender to themselves? Do they have the same civil rights as you and I, who would say that we're, we don't have that persuasion? So the debate is again, how do you read? How do you read the Constitution? How do you read the Declaration of Independence? How do you read the Civil Rights Act of 1964? And depending on how you read determines who you consider has rights and who does not have rights. So the persecution, were we being persecuted actively between 1863 and 1989? No. You can see an application of that persecution as we take on the concepts of, of Babylon as the Adventist church more and more loses its way. But the persecution was not, by, was not directed at Adventists. The persecution was directed at who? Particularly um, in the context of the civil rights movement, its prior history dealing with the Ku Klux Klan, this is the issue of racism. It's the issue of nationalism. That's the context of the persecution that is being dealt with. There is also an inclusion in, in that of sexism, both sexism just in general and also sexism directed towards black women who, who were not given the right to vote in 1919-1920. So about 25 years before, there is this increase of knowledge. You have this dying down of persecution and what do you know is going to happen? Persecution is going to rise up. So Ellen White saying they will be persecuted for their religious beliefs because that is what died down and is coming back up. But who was persecuted here? This is where we have to stand like A.T. Jones in Congress and say I don't care whether this is a law enforcing Saturday and it makes my life easier or whether this is a law enforcing Sunday and it persecutes me. We stand for people's rights whether, we, whether they directly affect us or whether they don't. Minorities, yes. So you can already start to see a, a compare but also a contrast. And this persecution also happened largely under a church-state union because the South was defending slavery based on what book? The Old Testament and portions of the New. So it was also a church-state argument and we've discussed that over the presentations gone before. We are not repeating as much as we did last year. So this presentation, for example, is unlikely to be repeated at another school or camp meeting by myself. Someone else may do that, but it's not going to be done even by them with their thoughts at the level it has been in the past. So we need to go back and watch. Watch Germany. Watch the German international camp meeting. Go back to the prior presentations that we've already done that go into the split through Protestantism, civil war in Protestantism. 1798, you have that split. 
You have that split in the Civil War. You have the split now. We talked about Mary Ralph. We talked about 1919 and the approach that a portion of Protestantism took at the very outset of globalism. But when it comes to this argument, just like this one, it's a split through Protestantism. I just wanted to remind us of what we've already covered before. So if Christ was to return here, and this was why we went on one of our tangents, if was Christ was to return in 1863, what did the United States have to do? Going back to our last two classes, what does the United States have to do? Become a beast. Yes, that beast has to speak as a dragon. So it's going to be a beast that speaks as a dragon. We looked at what that meant. What does it mean when it speaks as a dragon? We looked at the three branches of government. It'll be the actions of the legislative and the judicial. There has been some confusion caused that I'm suggesting that we don't see anything in the executive and that's not what I'm saying. If Mitch McConnell, I think it was Mitch McConnell, if Mitch McConnell wants to block Obama, someone correct me if I get Mitch McConnell and Jeff Sessions always in my mind I can't even picture them differently they feel like they feel like twins Mitch uh, Mitch McConnell is going to block Obama from appointing a justice to the Supreme Court why is he doing that because he's waiting for a change in what branch of government the executive branch he needs the executive branch to manipulate and and sway the judicial so I'm not suggesting that there is no action of the executive branch necessary to do that. We need to see the actions of the executive. But when it speaks, it's through the legislative and the judicial. And has, they're already arguing, Trump has appointed judges to the judicial branch who are uncharacteristically young and these are lifetime appointments. So the changes he's made to the judicial branch, can another president change them? No, this is unchangeable for a generation. That's the extent to which his actions are, cannot be undone. And again, it began in 2014, as, you would, as the lines tell you it would. So you need to see the United States speak as a dragon in the history prior to 1861 and we've already laid that out as being 1850 and the Fugitive Slave Act. So I want to give us a couple of quotes. These have been read before I'm sure but just so everyone has them. Review and Herald August 27. 1861. These would be quotes from the German camp meeting too. Paragraph 4. We will read J. and Andrews, 1855. I just want to read uh, the perspective they had of this of the um, 1850 Compromise. It's 108.1, .1, it just squeezes in there. 1842, William Miller. Two two seven point two, and I'm not going to read a lot from these, so don't panic. 
um, Testimonies Volume 1. This is 1861 Review and Herald. At the Roosevelt Conference, when the brethren and sisters were assembled on the day set apart for humiliation, tasting and fasting and prayer, Sabbath, August 3, the Spirit of the Lord rested upon us. So this is August 3 that she has this vision. August 3, 1861. This is the beginning history of the Civil War. Ellen White is taken off in vision and shown the sin of slavery. Slavery has long been a curse to this nation. The fugitive slave law was calculated to crush out of man every noble, generous feeling of sympathy that should arise in his heart for the oppressed and suffering slave. It was in direct opposition to the teaching of Christ. So, when she says it's in direct opposition to the teaching of Christ, if you keep that law, what are you doing? You're violating the law of God. So what they have done is institute a law that to keep would require you to trample on the law of God. Does that make sense? And you can keep it in the forehead or in the hand. God's scourge now is upon the north that they have so long submitted to the advances of the slave power. The sin of northern pro-slavery men is great. They have strengthened the south in their sin. So this compromise, did it just occur in 1850? No, this is a series of compromises that the north has been making over the last decades, over the last half century. These are long-standing compromises that have built up to the 1850 compromise. And I want to make the argument from the very beginning that where they compromised more than anywhere else leading up to 1850 was in their elections. They compromised in choosing their candidates for election because when they wanted to choose a candidate who particularly represented the North, they also wanted him to win. So would they choose one of those extremist abolitionists or would they look for a nice looking centrist. They kept going for the centrist and the centrist was not considered radical and to be radical would be to be abolitionist. So as we discuss more of the political history of that time I just want us to consider that thought. J. N. Andrews The downward course of our own nation, this is halfway through the paragraph, the downward course of our own nation, actually I'll begin from the beginning. He's referring to Matthew 23, the Pharisees. They say that had they lived in the days of their fathers, they would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. But when their hour and the power of darkness came upon them, how completely did it show them under the power of Satan? The downward course of our own nation on the subject of African slavery is a fearful warning of the abyss into which it is about to plunge. This is written in 1855 before the Civil War. The most infamous law of the 19th century is the Fugitive Slave Law. William Miller, 1842. All these powers have pretended to work miracles to establish their authority over the bodies and souls of men. But what are the principles which each of these teach their political followers? The dragon and his political party in whatever nation they may appear will support tyranny, slavery and aggrandizement of the few at the expense of the many. So what is William Miller saying you to look for? What's the spirit of the 1260? What should you expect to see when that spirit rises again? They will support the tyranny, tyranny, slavery and aggrandizement of the few of the minority at the expense of the powerful majority, the moral majority. 
They will try to establish their authority over the bodies and the souls of men. So even William Miller is recognizing slavery and the impact of equality on what you would expect these powers to look like. Going back to first testimony, Ellen White. We have men placed over us for rulers and laws to govern the people. Were it not for these laws, the condition of the world would be worse than it is now. So this idea of freedom, does it call for a lack of law or a lack of government? No. The issue is some of these laws are good, others are bad. The bad have been increasing and we are yet to be brought into straight places. But God will sustain his people in being firm and living up to the principles of his word. When the laws of men conflict with the word and law of God, we are to obey the latter, whatever the consequences may be. The law of our land requiring us to deliver a slave to his master, we are not to obey. And we must abide the consequences of violating this law. So this is going back to the first quote we made. I'll double check that. It's in direct opposition to the teaching of Christ. So when we come to the great controversy def uh, definition of the Sunday law, what is the problem with the Sunday law? It requires us to trample on the law of God. What was it about the 1850 compromise which made it the most infamous of the, 1850, uh, of the um, 19th century? It required you to trample on the law of God. Now you had to violate the laws of the land. So this is the 1850 compromise. It lines up with the uh, Sunday law waymark and it is, as you would expect, found in Early Writings, Spiritual Gifts, Volume 1, that that is the whole context of that first uh, document where she covers Earth's history from Eden to the Second Advent. And she centres the sins of Babylon on this issue right here. Because that is where you see, in William Miller's words, the tyranny, the... the um, work of that beast power to control the bodies and the souls of men, but now enforcing, trying to enforce people against their conscience to participate in the same. So I'll close here for time. Next, next week we want to delve more into the structure and um, start having an overview of the external events found in this structure. So just to summarise, to close, we have looked at all of the movements God has operated with to spread the message of his kingdom over the last, over 2,000 years. You have the end of ancient Israel, it's a movement. It arises in exactly the time necessary when you have this Roman peace, this special 200 year time period which is able to encapsulate the is able to encapsulate the growth and spreading of, of the gospel the work of Christ uh, and his disciples uh, John the Baptist Christ and his disciples the, and the work of Paul you had the uh, Roman roads peace on land and sea then you have the Protestant Reformation. That happens right on time as the printing press is able to be used to its fullest extent. And you have that method of communication give life to the Protestant Reformation right on time. You have the te uh, technological revolution of the early 1800s happen right on time, December 1830. Uh, the train system, but before that, steamboats and also the telegraph right on time for the spreading of the Millerite message. And it booms between 1850 and 1860. It booms 
by more than three times in this time period here because that is when the gospel is to go to the world. We spoke about the midnight cry message after Exodus, but even before that, how it spread on rail cars and steamboats. Then we talked about our own history. One of the evidences that God has raised up a movement to communicate a, a message is the technological revolution itself of the information age and the world wide web. We spoke that there is no light, there is no life outside of this movement. It should make sense to us for every other movement and we have the testimony of three. The reason the Protestant Reformation did not become God's church in the sense of ancient or modern Israel is because of their own failures. It also wasn't the time frame. It, it did its work, uh, a necessary work of, of um, preparation but they mixed, held on to so many Catholic ideas. You can't mix the, the message of a Pharisee with the parables of Christ. You cannot mix the, the Catholicism with uh, Martin Luther and he, he did that himself. You cannot mix the Protestant teachers of the day with the message of William Miller and Ellen White. You cannot mix Adventist pastors today after the veil has already been torn and expect them to give light to this movement. That's not how God teaches us. We then began to compare and contrast. This is mostly revision, but we did include this 25 year time period of the dying down of persecution. Here it's the abolishment of the Jesuit order and it starts to give people the freedom they need to enable this process. The Civil Rights Act did the same. Persecution arises ag again, persecution arises again. But you can see that this has all to do with equality, which is why it does, it did here and it will here. Through the before and through the history of the Sunday Law. We then looked at 1850 as a way mark and reminded us of, um, reminded us of the 1850 compromise and how it caused people to be confronted with a choice. You either trample the laws of God, obeying the laws of the land, or you disobey the law of the land and uphold the law of God, which is exactly what you would expect of the test at that way mark. And next week we will build the structure, the fractals of uh, our Alpha history and begin to look at external events. If you kneel with me, we'll close in prayer. After we have closed in prayer, we will have a short Q&A uh, and that will still be recorded. If you'll kneel with me. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for our blessings. Thank you for how you have led in our past history, not just in the one that we have now, but in the past history that extends over the last 2,000 years, 6,000 years, we see, Lord, that while we view you as all-powerful, because you have chosen to work through humanity, you are limited. You are limited by our own networks, by our own communications. If you want to work through Paul, Lord, you need to wait for there to be peace on the Roman sea and on the Roman roads. Lord, you, you'd love the people worldwide equally, but we see how you have been limited by humanity, by your desire to work through humanity. We are grateful for your patience with us. We are thankful, Lord, for the technology that we have today, that we can speak and we can teach and we can learn together the messages that you now wish communicated worldwide. We are grateful, Lord, that this communication opens up so much of the world. We think about countries where even YouTube is controlled. There are portions, Lord, where the light can't extend because of their own dictatorial governments. We see how you are still limited by countries that struggle with electricity, that struggle with access to Wi-Fi, 
that struggle with governments that are repressive regimes and control uh, the online access of their people. But still we see you do your very best. I pray, Lord, that there might still be ways to reach these people, that they cannot be so limited in their ability to hear this gospel message. I pray, Lord, we'll learn correctly the message of selflessness, that the midnight cry is designed to create in us, that we consider those outside of ourselves, the needs of those outside of ourselves, the civil rights of those outside of ourselves. I pray, Lord, that we will understand the nature of your kingdom and why it is exclusive, why they are, there are rules about who can enter and who cannot. May we see your love in these rules. May we see what they are designed to teach us and the healing that they are designed to create in us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.